sort of stigma that floats around with grass. It's, uh, it's very seasonal. So we sort of deal with it in spring and fall and forget about it in the summertime when it all greens up. Uh, I feel like maybe there's this bit of an idea that it can't do much damage. Uh, it's not as scary as a forest fire. Um, and I started out building this presentation to present to our own wildfire crews. We do a little spring boot camp every year. And I feel like like the wildfire folks, you know, we don't deal with grass a lot. And uh, our experience with it is pretty minimal. So I'd, I'd like everyone to remember that this is our, our flashiest and most reactive fuel type that we have in the Canadian Forest Fire Danger Rating System. Um, I guess a reminder too, like when, when do the wildland folks get our biggest, baddest fires? It's, it's in Alberta in the springtime. So grass contributes a lot to our fire control problems. Um, so if you have anything you're wondering about grass, pop it in the chat box. I will do my best to find an answer for you. Uh, if I don't know the answer on the spot, I promise to follow up with uh, some sort of answer. So. This video I'm playing is a, a large scale grass fire burning in Nevada. Um, and so I just like to remind people that a lot of the grass fires that we may respond to don't look like the grass fires that maybe you folks respond to, which might look a little bit more like that. All right, throughout my presentation, I've embedded some polls. So the way that you can join my poll is to either go to pollev.com slash KG484 or you can just text a message um, to that number. So text my, the, the, the word KG484 to 37607 and then uh, answer the question. And I feel like it's really hard for me to sit in a computer and not be able to see anybody's reaction or hear anybody laugh to my jokes. So this is my way of interacting with you. So this is my test question um, to see if it works. So if you guys folks don't mind, can you answer the question, where are we joining this presentation from? And the answer should stream live. Well, look, it's working. Great. Thanks for playing along. Uh, so I do have a couple other questions in my presentation. It really helps me understand um, some of the things that you guys observe or experience in the field. Wow, we got good turnout. We've got uh, Edson and Strathcona, Yurkana, Ireland, wow. Grimshaw, Nanton. I appreciate everybody tuning in. Uh, that's great. Great, looks like the polls are working. So I do have a, another poll question here. So what word comes to mind when you're responding to a grass fire? It can be anything, maybe not a swear word, but, uh, you know, is it is it going to be late for dinner? Yeah. Is it going to be hard work? Is it going to be lots of mop up? Oh, wind is good. Dirty. Yes. Lots of ash. What kind of resources are you going to need to deploy? Quick, right. Grass fires seem to move really fast. Wind seems to be a popular answer. Unpredictable, great, that's a great one. I uh, I would agree with you there. Exciting, right? Yeah, getting out, watching things burn. Topography, another good one. Wildland urban interface, I see. Fuel, great, these are all um, great answers. Thanks for participating. I, I, uh, I like seeing these words. Wind and quick are the biggest ones. And so we'll talk definitely about that when we talk about fire behavior. All right, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of my background. Uh, Brian asked me to introduce myself. So uh, I started in the fire world as a research technician with FP Innovation. So basically they hired me for five seasons to count sticks and swap bugs and sort grass. And eventually they let me light a few things on fire. My fire career started there. I uh, have a Bachelor of Science in Environmental and Conservation Sciences from U of A. And then I did a Master of Science in Forestry from U of T and I focused on wildfire. And so my career has sort of taken me a bunch of different places, uh, basically counting grass and sorting sticks and lighting things on fire. Uh, the top left picture here, I did two years as a research assistant in New Zealand studying fire. So I looked at uh, some of the grass 
modifier behavior related to their specific forms of grass, like tussock grass. Um, so here's us counting, sorting grass. These are actually people sitting in chairs, sorting live grass from dead grass. Don't let anyone tell you science isn't cool. Um, these people think they're pretty cool. Those are all bags full of grass. And then we get to light it on fire. So I'm going to show you some footage from some of these research uh, activities that we did. This video I'm going to play in the bottom right uh, are some experiments that we lit uh, looking at the cu effect of curing on grass fire spread. So I went to Australia for six months to help out with some research over there and I ended up staying for five years um, because it was such a great uh, experience over there. I've been with uh, Alberta Wildfire now for six years and I just recently changed over to a training specialist here at the Hinton Training Center. And uh, talking about fire behavior to the people that it matters most to is my passion. I teach fire behavior to crew leaders, crew members, to advanced fire behavior. And I'm now the chair of the uh, fire behavior specialist course for the country. Um, so thanks today for giving me an opportunity to speak with you. I guess this isn't necessarily meant to replace S100G, but uh, I had to flip through it and there was a couple of things in there that need to be updated. So some of the information I'll give to you is new uh, related to that. And I just want to give a high five to a couple of peers that I, I did manage to consult with uh, building this. So Marty Alexander, sort of the grandfather of fire behavior in wildland fire in Canada. He's done a lot of research and I did catch up with Steve Otway. I appreciate him uh, reaching out and helping me with some, some content. All right, let's get to the guts. So um, here's my presentation objectives for the day. Uh, I'm gonna provide a brief refresher on some wildfire behavior terms and concepts just so that we're all speaking the same language. Then I'm gonna hope to stimulate some critical thinking when we are actioning grass fires based on some in new information I'm going to share. And these are some critical updates uh, related to new knowledge about spread and fire behavior in the grass. So the reason I was sort of uh, pushed along to do this is uh, there was the, you know, every year we have some big grass fires in the springtime. This one was particularly spicy in March 28th near Carmen Gay. There was quite a large grass fire that grew quite quickly. I think there was like 100 kilometer per hour winds down there. Uh, there was a person in critical condition with multiple injuries in relation to this fire. And I have a few friends on structural departments down there who had sort of told me a story that to me sounds a lot like something we would call entrapment, which sounds like a scary word or a dirty word or word that doesn't people don't want to talk about or admit that happened to them, um, which I wish we wouldn't shy away from it as it really helps us learn when we talk about things like entrapment. So here's the definition of entrapment. Uh, it's a situation where personnel are unexpectedly caught in a fire behavior related position where planned escape routes or safety zones are absent, inadequate, or compromised. So it may or may not result in an injury, which is key here. Because I think when we hear the word entrapment, you know, we think about Yarnell or we think about shelter deployments in the States where they get burned over and there's mass fatalities. But really, an entrapment is any position where you are compromised. Um, and so I know. Nobody likes to admit it out loud, but uh, I've definitely been compromised on the fire line. Um, I wish we could talk about it more freely and not feel like we're in trouble for being compromised. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with this, this video. This was uh, 2016, April 16th, so similar time of year. Uh, this is at Ray Gibbon Drive near Bike Lake. I guess uh, this is the St. Albert Fire Services. One of their members had to jump into the Sturgeon River to avoid a firewall that was kicked up by a grass fire here. Luckily, uh, he was okay and suffered minor burns. But by definition, would you consider this an entrapment situation? And, and my answer is yes. Obviously, the escape routes and safety zones that this individual had planned uh, didn't work out to plan when the firewall kicked up and he was forced into the water. Um, water is not necessarily a good plan for a safety zone, especially in April. Um, hypothermia definitely um, a factor at this time of year. So thinking about, you know, big bad grass fires and thinking about entrapment sort of encouraged me to, to put together some information about, about grass fire. And so I'm just going to review 
a few common denominators. So these are common denominators of fire behavior on fatality fires in the U.S. So the Forest Service took 1926 to 1976, they collected all the information on fatalities down there. There was 145 men died and they came up with four common denominators of fire behavior. So hold them in your mind when we think about the last, the last picture and the last fire I talked about. The first one is on small fires or on isolated sections of large fires. In deceptively light fuel, such as grass and light brush. During unexpected shifts in wind direction or speed resulting in flare ups, particularly during mop up. And the last one is when fire responds to a change in topographic conditions. So running uphill surprisingly fast in chimneys, gullies or steep slopes. So I think some of those words uh, actually showed up in my little survey about things you were thinking about when you were responding to a grass fire. That's great. You know, we're thinking about some of these uh, conditions. So can anyone think of a famous firefighting story that that almost all of these came true in? I guess, uh, does anybody remember the Man Gulch fire? So August 5th, 1949, the Upper Missouri River in Montana. If you've ever heard that uh, Cold Missouri Water song by James Keelhan, he sort of tells the story. Uh, Wag Dodge lit a small fire to escape a grass fire that had chased him and his crew up a steep gulch. Um, they weren't able to outrun that fire and 13 firefighters died. So uh, there's that pretty much follows all four of those common denominators. They were on a small part of a big fire. They were working in light fuels. Um, there was a change in wind speed related to some weather coming in and then the fire chased them up slope. So they pretty much had all the, the denominators. So, so what? This was a fire in the U.S. That stuff doesn't happen to us, right? Well, here's Bernie Swan. Bernie Swan is a, a case study that we use in the advanced fire behavior course. Um, he died in 1993, structural firefighter. Uh, he responded to a grass fire in Annerley, Saskatchewan. It, it was October, so this was a fall fire. But have a look at the weather conditions. Nothing particularly stand out other than that wind speed. So 20 degrees, relative humidity 40%, and fairly strong winds. Uh, that was at one o'clock. It had been about seven days since rain. So kind of common denominators do we already see in this image. You know, we've got light fuels. There's a fairly strong wind speed. You have a look at that photo on the, on the right there. There's actually some pretty significant topography. Yes, it's Saskatchewan and we can make flat jokes, but this, uh, this grass on this slope, that's a pretty significant slope for a grass fire. It was enough to dramatically affect the fire behavior. Um, here's some images of where they found Bernie. Um, there was some, you can see where the, the direction of the wind and where the fire started uh, from the household there in the background. There was a, a little bit of a gully and then upslope to where, where Bernie was found. Um, he died as a result of the burns he sustained trying to put this fire out. And I think that the number of you carry a little pocket grass fire behavior card. Um, Bernie is who inspired that for everybody to be carrying. So I hope you still carry that, that grass fire behavior card around. Okay, so let's talk some specifics about, about grass fire behavior. You know, for me, a lot of times this video I'm showing in the right, this is what we picture, right? It's a little smoldering fire, we get out our water, it pretty much makes the fire go away instantly. It only takes a little bit of, little bit of water and there it goes. Um, so I guess the questions I'm posing today are, you know, can we always use direct attack? How big can the flames get? And how fast can a grass fire move? Do we really know the answers to these questions? Um, I'm hoping to provide you some background information um, where we can talk about it. So, but before we can talk about it. I am going to do a little bit of a review of a couple of fire behavior concepts. So let's talk about uh, a little bit of terminology here. So grass curing, when I talk about grass curing, I'm talking about the percentage of dead grass as compared to live grass. So if I say 60% cured, that means 60% of the biomass out there is dead. So there's some photos here along the bottom. We have the condition of the grass in the spring, summer and fall. 
Obviously, the curing uh, goes down in the summertime as things green up. And in the springtime, we have matted grass where the snow has squashed it and pushed it down. And in the fall time, after it's regrown all summer, it dies standing up and we have standing grass. The next term I'd like to do a review on is flame length. So this is the length of flames measured along their axis of the fire front. So a lot of times, you know, what you're seeing when you're standing next to it might be the height, but you have to consider the angle that the wind is forcing that flame or the slope is forcing that flame. So I just like to provide this picture. So when I'm talking flame length today, this is what I'm talking about, is that total length of the, of the fire. Um, and I talk about it because it's an indicator of head fire intensity, which uh, we're gonna talk about next. So fire intensity is the amount of heat or energy released per unit length of fire front. Um, it's measured in kilowatts per meter. Seems like a fairly kind of abstract concept, but if you were to take a meter of the front of fire and how much heat energy is being released, that's what we're measuring. And we can estimate that out on the fire line by using this equation. We always joke in the advanced fire behavior that to remember it for the test, the acronym is I hope we're right. So we use I as the intensity in kilowatts per meter. Uh, H is a constant. It's the heat of combustion for cellulose. So how much energy is released per unit of cellulose. The W is how much fuel is consumed. So how much of that grass is actually going to burn up when the fire front passes over. And R is the rate of spread. So the forward rate of spread of that fire in meters per minute. So when I use the term intensity, I'm talking about that energy release. And so this is something that we use quite a bit in wildland. I, I'm not as, as sure what, uh, if you guys refer to intensity class when you guys are deploying to fires. Uh, we have six classes of intensity. It starts at less than 10 kilowatts per meter. Um, that's sort of a smoldering ground or creeping surface fire, not a lot of flames. The next class up, we start to see low vigor surface fire. Um, sometimes we start to see the bottoms of the individual trees be consumed when we're talking about forest fires. And the sort of classes go up. And I guess I'm not going to read through all of them, but these are sort of a universal language now for our firefighters. Uh, anytime you get deployed as a wildland firefighter across Canada, all of them are now using these intensity classes um, for them to understand what they're headed out for for the day. We can relate flame lengths to these intensity classes and I've put them in here. I know uh, I worked with a volunteer unit in Australia and they preferred to know how big the flames were compared to how tall they were. So here's uh, the flame lengths. We sort of go from less than two meters or sort of chest height or lower when we're talking intensity classes one or two. Uh, we get sort of 1.5 to 3.5 meters for those middle classes. And when we get into intensity class five or six, we're talking three and a half meters or greater. So sort of twice our height or bigger. Uh, some important thresholds here. Most of our hand crews, we decided that if the intensity is greater than 4,000 kilowatts per meter, it's not safe to do direct attack anymore. So we would be considering something like indirect attack or parallel attack. And something that I wish the public knew was that at 9,000 kilowatts per meter or so, a lot of our aircraft are no longer efficient at fighting the fire either. So bucket drops, tanker drops, once you're getting into intensity class six and beyond, you have big towering convection columns. It says listed here, great walls of flame, fire whirls, long distance spotting. Uh, it's pretty difficult uh, for a helicopter with a bucket to have any impact on that sort of intensity. Uh, this is the Canadian Forest Fire Danger Rating System. I think uh, most of you have seen it in passing. This is definitely, we use this on a daily basis in Alberta. We make millions of dollars based on these numbers, or we spend millions of dollars based on these numbers, where we put our helicopters, where we put our crews, where it's safe to put people on the fire line. This drives so many of the decisions we make. Um, these numbers are uh, mean a lot to us. So there are three moisture codes and they take the effect of weather and they estimate the moisture content of different size classes of fuel. 
And then there's three indexes, and those indexes help us understand potential for fire spread and how much fuel is going to be consumed by the fire. Um, I'm going to try to stay out of the weeds and not talk too much about the fine fuel moisture code or duff moisture code today. Um, we use them as inputs into our fire behavior prediction system. So there's a handy little field guide, that red book in my photo there. I carry around this in my pocket and it allows me to predict rates of spread, intensity classes, and the type of fire that I, I might encounter out there. So a super powerful tool. Um, it is available now for, for most people to have a look at. Uh, I'm gonna show you some pages of the book and we're gonna talk about them. But if you'd like to learn more, this is a little plug for us. Uh, we are offering from the Hinton Training Center a couple of online wildfire training for free right now. So we have fire behavior fundamentals, uh, the principles of fire behavior, and then the fire weather index and fire behavior prediction system are both on there, all my red circles. So if you'd like to, to learn what the numbers mean or, or how they all work together, if you'd like to learn more about that, you can still register for these courses. Um, I would say that you should do it soon as we're accepting people till end of April. I think that you should be able to get this information from somebody in your department, but if you can't find it, uh, email me. Uh, I will hook you up with how you get onto this. All right, poll time. So let's talk about uh, flame length. So how big can flames get on a grass fire? Let's see what you guys think. And uh, I have meters there. I'm a metric child. I, I missed the imperial system by a little bit, but feel free to write what you want. 10 meters. Those are some big flames. 10 meters. What else do people say? Five, five meters. All right, we got some threes and fours. Eight meters plus. Two point seven eight, very specific. Good answer. <laughs> Some five. So we're sort of getting this four to five to eight uh, heights for for flame flame lengths here. All right, let's talk about it in some detail. Let's see what the system says. So I got some pictures here that I, I've sort of pulled out of the what we have at the training center. So if we talk about the intensity classes, I've got them in the bottom left there. If we forget. So if we're thinking about a 2000 kilowatt per meter fire, that's about 2.5 meters. So we're definitely getting bigger than three meter flames, definitely possible. Uh, so here's another fellow with some, or lady or fellow with some water. How big are those flames? Looks like, you know, under chest height. So we're still in that intensity class three, two or three here. Um, Okay, I got some bigger ones here. This is maybe twice the size of the, the firefighters on the ground there. So the upper limit of direct attack that I said was 4,000 kilowatts per meter. That's about three meters in flame length. So this person of the picture I just pulled up, that's starting to be getting a little dangerous for them to be trying to directly attack those flames. So let's think about how big they could get. I got a couple more pictures here. Here's another fellow. He's got a drip torch or he or she has a drip torch. Looks like they're walking away from that fire. So they probably lit it. And here's my friend from Australia. Uh, no PPE, lighting some things on fire in the Australian bush. I, I just like to share that one because it makes me smile. So I did some math here for you. It, I looked at uh, a couple of different thoughts on how big they could get. If we had an intensity class five fire, so say an intensity of 6,000 kilowatts per meter, the flame length there would be about four meters high. So we saw some in our little voting, we saw four or five. Once we bridge into that intensity class six or over 10,000 kilowatts per meter, you can easily get flame lengths of over five meters. So the question remains, can we actually get intensity class six in grass fires? You know, would we ever get to a point where we would exceed direct attack in grass fires? Uh, what about air attack? Do you think that we could go over that with, with grass fires? Let's, uh, let's have a closer look at intensity. 
got this video I'm going to play. I think it's a great visual when we talk about grass fire intensity. So this is a, a grass, matted grass fire burn in Colorado. What you see spinning around are tumbleweeds. So these, these folks are out uh, doing this. I think it's a hazard reduction burn. But look at the convective activity. So we saw that fire whirl in St. Albert. This is the same sort of thing. So this fire is generating enough energy to interact with the atmosphere. And the visual here are those tumbleweeds spinning around. Um, I think it's a super strong visual where you can see that hot air lifting, stirring up the, the tumbleweeds, uh, that twisting that we often see in the smoke columns. And for me, it's a clear indicator of, of the potential for a higher intensity fire. Um, these folks on the ground don't seem too concerned about what's going on. Um, they, uh, I think, feel that this is within a realm that they can control. I guess a, a fire world to me is showing unstable atmospheric conditions. You can see the skies there are fairly clear, not a lot of clouds. They might be, you know, sitting under uh, some sort of unstable air mass. Um, as that cellulose, cellulose is combusting, it's adding a bunch of moisture to the column, which is creating lift. And so like think about thunderstorms on a, on a hot, humid day, moisture gets lofted into the atmosphere and creates turbulence and smoke columns are the exact same thing. They're like a lot like baby thunderstorms and it just can cause the fire to be to behave in super erratic ways. So I guess, you know, what sort of intensity class do you think we're seeing here? Uh, there's not a lot of flame length to go by, um, but judging by how much energy is being lofted into the atmosphere. I, I'm probably going to put it in the, the 3000 kilowatt per meter zone. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a video of when this gets particularly interesting, but I did do some sleuthing on the internet and eventually this did get away from them. Um, it was a super unstable day. The fire whirls uh, or the, the whirls there picked up and threw a bunch of burning embers into grass that they hadn't uh, planned on igniting and off it went. So good visuals showing the potential for intensity in grass. Okay, so this graphic that I've got up on the right hand side, this is a page out of the Red Book, out of the Fire Behavior Prediction uh, Systems Field Guide. What I'm showing you is a page called O1A, that's our fuel type for matted grass. This page gives us a couple of different things. It is giving us, if you see that intensity class is there, so the color ramps correspond to the intensity class of the fire you're getting. Along the vertical axis, we have our initial spread index, which is a measure of how dry our fuel, fine fuels are and how windy it is. And we combine that with how cured the grass is. So remember I talked about grass curing, the higher the number, the more dead biomass there is out there. So this table is taking the three important factors in grass fire behavior which is the degree of curing and the fuel moisture content and the wind speed together. So what I like to point out on this table is, hey, look at all that red in the bottom corner. So our fire behavior prediction guide is telling us that we can quite easily get intensities, uh, intensity class four, five, or six. There's a, you know, almost a third of that page is a red in color. So remember the top end of class four is where we're talking about no more direct attack. So there's quite a lot of instances in that table where it's gonna predict fire that is too dangerous to be approaching directly from the front. So uh, I guess, you know, if we look at those numbers and the red there, we can definitely get intense fire. So let's, Think about the conditions that they might happen under because maybe we're going in our heads oh it's got to be 40 degrees and the wind's got to be blowing 100 kilometers an hour well, let's dig through it so I, I did some back calculating here for you and i found some examples of conditions that would give us uh these intensity classes so the first one if we had 90 to 100 percent cured grass fine fuel moisture coat of 84 and a wind speed of 35 we can get intensity class four grass fire so those conditions are fairly benign. I have a little note in the gray box. Um, if, if fine fuel moisture code doesn't work for you, you can easily convert it using the equation 101 minus the fine fuel moisture code gives you a percentage of moisture content. So if we take 101 and we minus 84, 
you get a moisture content of 17%. So, so that's fairly, you know, it's not crazy dry for fuels. And that wind speed there isn't something ridiculous. We're not talking those dry spring days where we can get 100 kilometer hour winds in southern Alberta. Um, if that grass is dead and cured, you can quite easily approach an intensity class for grass fire. Here's another example. So slightly less cured. So maybe things have started to green up a little bit. We have 80 to 90% cured grass, a fine fuel moisture coat of 90, which is 11% moisture content and 30 kilometer per hour winds. So that seemed like a fairly common springtime condition. Uh, I would say so. And that's giving us intensity class five. So we're getting to the point definitely where direct attack is no longer safe. And at this point, we can be get, definitely be getting flame lengths of five meters or greater. One last example gives us intensity class six. So we have 90 to 100% cured grass, so it's totally dead. Things are quite dry, so fine fuel moisture coat of 93, which gives us a moisture content of 8%, and winds of 35 kilometers per hour. So a hot, dry, Windy day with dead grass, you can definitely get intensity class six. So we can definitely challenge uh, the effectiveness of crews on the ground. We can definitely challenge the effectiveness of even our aircraft at this point, including uh, helicopters with buckets and our air tankers. Does that surprise anybody? I hope so, maybe a little bit. Okay, I asked about how fast do you think the fires can go? Well, okay, here's a, a video I'm going to show you. This is from uh, an experiment that I was a part of in Australia. This is the Country Fire Authority. They are a structural based firefighting group in Victoria, Australia. We did some really neat experiments over there where we um, took herbicide and killed off grass in fields at different rates so we can run them together. So I'm just gonna show you this video of how fast these fires move. Uh, it's telling you that the wind speed's about 25 kilometers per hour and the moisture of that grass is about 10%. So we just talked about conditions similar to that. Um, this video is not sped up. I'm showing you it in real time. They show it on the top there in the middle. Uh, these block lengths are about 33 meters long. Uh, have a look at how fast it can travel across that block. So here they are, they're igniting it from both ends. The fire starts to accelerate. It doesn't take long for it to get going. You can see we have 90% cured on the left and 100% cured grass on the right. Nope, the fellow on the right trying to get out of the way, he quickly realizes that maybe he should move a little bit faster out of the way and into the black. Um, we did, during these experiments, we melted three engines. So uh, I think we were all underestimating how fast those fires could move as well. So that's 30 seconds to travel 30 meters. So the rate of spread there is six for the 90% cured grass and six and a half kilometers per hour. Uh, for the fully cured grass. So that being said, six kilometers per hour, do you think you can run that fast? I'm curious. Here's my poll. What rate of spread do you think you can outrun? And I've got my little table here. Those numbers in the chart represent rate of spread. So you can see, you know, once we get up into the intensity class six, we're talking 193 meters per minute. How fast do you think, um, you can run. Could you outrun an intensity class three fire? 10, 10 meters a minute? All right, we got eight kilometers per hour. So those ones we just saw in the block, we saw the, the firefighter there get out of the way and it was six kilometers an hour. He had no trouble moving out of the way. Anybody else dare to tell me how fast they think they can go in their gear? 12 kilometers per hour. <laughs> You've never seen me run. <laughs> That's right. We have some adrenaline. Makes us go a little faster. Four kilometers per hour. If there was topography involved, do you think you could go as fast? Ten kilometers per hour. 
if you had to move, you know, more than 300 meters, could you go 10 kilometers an hour for more than 300 meters? All right, see, and this is a question, right? We, you know, as a fire behavior analyst, I'm spewing numbers all the time. I'm telling you meters per minute, but I don't actually know. Do you know how fast that means to you? So I put together this next slide. So Saint Bolt, who's the fastest sprinter in the world, he can go 100 meters at 612 meters per minute. So that's pretty fast. Uh, I didn't translate these to kilometers per hour, but I think that's in the sort of 12 kilometers per hour. Here's Dennis Cometo. He's the fastest marathoner ever. I saw somebody say, depends how far you have to go. So here, this guy, he does 40, is it 42 kilometers? And he can do it at 314 meters per minute. So if you look at my chart on the right, you know, the fastest it can sort of go is about 200 meters per minute. So Hussein and Dennis, they're probably okay. There was a study done by FP Innovations that looked at how fast crews could actually move in the grass. So on flat ground, carrying their gear, this is a wildland firefighting crew, they could move about 134 meters per minute. Um, and this was for 500 meters, I believe, in the study. So, you know, there's a couple fires in there that if they had taken all their gear with them, probably not going to be able to move faster than the fire. Uh, and this bottom one is just a comparison. This is in C2, so that would be a, a forest, a spruce forest. They can only go about 100 meters per minute trying to move their way through the trees. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that this is a little bit surprising for you. We're definitely forecasting fires that are moving faster than you can move. Um, does anybody have any ideas of what the fastest spreading grass fire ever was? How fast it was going? This is it. It was in South Australia in 2005. It's the Wangari fire. It burned 77,000 hectares. It was burning cropland and paddocks, so lots of grass. Uh, the conditions on the day, 32 degrees Celsius. The winds were 65 kilometers per hour, gusting 80 kilometers per hour. So uh, pretty significant fire. There was nine fatalities and 115 people were injured. And that fire was going 500 meters a minute in a couple of its fastest runs. Uh, this was from the report where they analyzed the fire spread and behavior so it's going 500 meters a minute. So, you know, that's pretty significant. I think a lot of us would be very challenged by that. Um, I don't think we should be expecting ourselves to be able to outrun that. Um, so this fire <clears throat> the, got to about 1,000 degrees Celsius um, in the fire front itself. Uh, there was 47,000 stock animals killed. Um, 93 houses were lost. People were jumping off cliffs into the ocean to survive. So all sorts of scary things all happening very quickly. It was started by a hot vehicle exhaust uh, that ignited dry vegetation at a roadside. So these sorts of things can definitely happen. Um, same sort of, you know, we're like, oh, it's in another country. But, you know, that ignition is the exact same sort of thing that we get around here. And we have similar grass loadings to what Australia does. Okay, so we looked at some of the fire behavior metrics of grass. So we talked about flame length, rate of spread, and intensity. Let's uh, talk about maybe some of the characteristics of grass and how it drives some of these fire behavior things. So I've got a couple here to highlight. I'm going to talk a little bit about fuel moisture. So this is how wet or dry the fuels are. We have our code in the FWI system called the Fine Fuel Moisture Code. And it was developed for litter moisture in a closed canopy conifer stand. So our system is based on empirical research. A bunch of scientists went out. They, like me, they were counting grass, sorting sticks, measuring things, weighing things, drying things in ovens. So all the research that they did was in a stand of trees. And they never actually looked at grass or something out in the open. So in this closed canopy, it's implicitly compensating for the sheltering effect of the canopy from rain and sun and a reduction in surface wind. 
So you also have this wetness of the organic layer below. So there's, you know, the duff and peat that sits underneath the forest and there's moisture transport from below as well. So when we think about grass, it's living in a completely different world. So grass is completely exposed. It's mostly unshaded, the sort of grass that we're, we see. Um, moisture content of the litter layer is not super influenced by moisture from an organic layer underneath or the soil underneath. A lot of times there's not a very deep organic layer under there. So because of that, we would have to assume that grass fuels dry lots much faster than forest litter. This is a common observation. So grass fuels have been observed to dry quickly and can be ready to sustain fire spread in just a few hours after rain. I don't know how many of you woke up in the morning and there's dew on the grass and by the afternoon, there could be a fire in the grass or you could be lighting hazard reduction burns or maybe you get a report of an ignition. These fuels out in the sun and the wind all day, they dry out really quick. And unfortunately, our system of accounting for it just doesn't capture that fact that it's unshaded and doesn't get moisture from underneath. So what happened recently is that the Canadian Forest Service decided that it was time to actually quantify the effect of this in the grass. So they published a document. I have the link in my instructor notes if anyone wants to see it. But they published a paper looking at a modified fine fuel moisture code. And what they've done is try to account for the effects of sun and to increase that response time for those fine grass fuels. So uh, they modified the existing fine fuel moisture code to incorporate the physical characteristics of the environment that grass grows in. So they did this by, they measured fuel temperature, they calculated the equilibrium moisture content, they measured how fast those fuel particles responded to change in moisture, and then they captured the rainfall in canopy, without a canopy, so out in the open, to see how different it was from in stand. So what they found that this fine fuel moisture code that Alberta spends a bunch of money on that we, you know, use this number day in and day out is that it tended to, to greatly over predict moisture content. So predicted conditions were wetter than what was actually observed. And that is totally expected given what we just said about grass growing out in the open. So when the grass surface layer is moist, like after rain or morning dew, standing grass is generally much drier than the matted material. During clear drying days, when sun is playing an important role in heating the fuel, the, the layer can dry to value several percentage points lower than standing grass. So it's pretty important that we capture this. So the chart I have on the right, not everybody the chart person, I like charts. Basically what it's showing is that the model is underperforming. So in my red box below, that's the note you need to know. Conditions in grass will be drier than what our FW9 numbers think. So if you see a fine field moisture code of 90, which for us in Alberta, spidey senses tingle, we go, oh, it's going to be a bad day. Well, it's probably 94 or 95 already in the grass. So that fast reacting fuel layer, we have to keep in mind that our numbers might not necessarily represent uh, what's out there on the ground. So this new research, um, there is a way now to modify our code so we can actually put it up by a certain number of points and calculate this um, to, to compensate for that change in the weather. So that's important. Fuel load. So fuel load, what I'm talking about when I say fuel load is the dry weight of combustible material per unit area. So if you look at my picture of grass here, if you were to take a meter square, cut it up and dry it in the oven and then weigh how much is there, that's going to give you your fuel load. So it's essentially how many logs you throw in on the fire. And what our system does is assumes that all the grass looks the same. So this is a stand of three tons per hectare. So three tons of, of grass material per hectare of land. Um, so does this look like every grassy field you've ever stood in? I doubt it. We've seen all sorts of different configurations of grass. Um, what about grass that's been grazed? Or what about croplands like wheat and barley? They burn, but do they look like this? Does it have a similar fuel load? So our problem is, is we don't really know how grass behaves in, stand, in fields with, with more fuel per hectare. Uh, so 
There was some research that came out recently by Susan Kidney from the University of Toronto. She did a master's on tall grass prairies in Ontario. And as part of her thesis, she took some photos showing some different fuel loads. So this is the nominal one that we assume in our system. So here's some pictures showing that it's not always like that out there. So here's four tons per hectare, six tons per hectare. So now we're double what the model thinks we have out there, double sort of our standard value. She found fields that were eight tons per hectare, 10 tons per hectare, and even 11 tons per hectare. So that's a significant increase in how many logs for, for say, how much fuel is there to contribute to fire, to the fire behavior. So if you're not standing in a perfect three ton per hectare field of grass, our fire behavior forecasting system uh, can't necessarily predict what you're gonna see. So in her thesis, she had a look at how does fuel load affect the behavior of that grass. So if you have more grass on site, what does that mean for your fire behavior? Um, the table on the right is a, a table that she made. Along the top, she's got a fuel load. And on the vertical axis, she has how fast it's moving. And there's those intensity classes again. So have a look. There's a lot of red in this table now, lots of intensity class six, especially when you get into those higher fuel loads. So that's a key finding is that uh, the intensity of the fire increases as fuel load increases. And along with that, your flame lengths get longer. And we know tied to that, it's gonna get harder to put that fire out. Um, interestingly, she found that the rate of spread isn't necessarily impact by the fuel load. So there is some impact due to how the moisture varies in those more dense grass fields. But the fuel load itself has a fairly minimal effect on the rate of forward spread. Um, but definitely affects the intensity of that fire and the flame length. I have another note here that says residence time increases as well. So residence time is how long it takes for the flame front to pass. So in a standard grass, you know, maybe we in our back of our mind is like, oh, I'll just jump through the flames and I'll be fine. You know, a standard sort of lower intensity grass fire, it's sort of three to four seconds it takes for the flame front to pass. Whereas if you're looking at uh, these higher fuel loads, she found that on average it was 27 seconds um, for the flame front to pass through that, that load. So as the fuel load goes up, your residence time goes, goes up as well. So we start to trust our Nomex clothing uh, a little bit less and less. Uh, another thing I want to talk about is there's been an update to the system related to the effect of curing. So our previous research suggested that grass didn't actually start burning until we hit 60% cured. Um, this is another uh, experiment I was part of in Australia in a town called Wangaratta. Here we are lighting fires under the exact same fuel conditions. So it's the same day. We have two drones flying in the air taking a video and we're simultaneously igniting two blocks of fire. So let's have a watch of this video. On the left, we have a block that's partially cured. It's only 50% cured. And on the right, we have 90% cured grass. Uh, the weather conditions are the same. So our, our dead fuel moisture content is 3.5%. Um, the wind speed here is 20 kilometers per hour. So it's in real time. 31 degrees and the RH is 17%. So the one on the left is, is partially cured and the one on the right is almost fully cured. Okay, so they're doing the simultaneous ignition. And so for saying that grass fire is not gonna spread in 60% cured or less, I think that fire on the left is um, spreading, definitely moving. Obviously the one on the right is moving faster. These again are 33 meter long blocks, um, but it's only been about 30 seconds. But I think a lot of the researchers were quite surprised. Like look at the flame length on that partially cured block. That that grass is half green 
and under the you know specific conditions it still burns and it looks like it's putting out flame lengths and intensities that would be quite difficult to to suppress directly um, it is going to burn out as it hits the end of the block so altering that fuel structure by having a fuel break is enough to slow that fire down um, definitely so the cured one has already burned completely out of the block and the partially one is is still still going so i guess you know that what the video was meant to show is that you know our book is wrong so uh, if you have an old red book you need to get a new one because we now have tables so you look at this o1a page from the red book along the top now the degree of curing goes from zero all the way to, to 100 before we didn't even uh, include zero to 60 percent cured but we can see that my little yellow box is showing that uh, fire will burn will spread uh, with those even with the grass is half green so what do we need for that to happen? We need an ISI of 20. So that's our initial spread index. So that would be uh, 50 kilometer hour winds with a fine fuel moisture coat of 85. Or say a little bit drier, fine fuels, not a fine fuel moisture coat of 90 with 30 kilometers per hour wind. Or if things are particularly dry, particular dry day, 94, fine fuel moisture coat 94 with 20 kilometers an hour wind. Um, you can get fire moving you know, 12 to 20 meters per minute, and you can be sort of pushing on the edge of uh, difficulties with direct attack. For that reason, I have a red note here. If you do have a red book or you are using a red book, uh, the older versions don't include the effect of this. So use the second edition or newer. So 2016, they released a new, new book. So uh, I would say that would be a good idea to get a new book. The last piece of research I want to share with you is some work being done again in Australia on croplands. So Australia is sort of the leader for grass fire behavior. The numbers that we use in our red book come from Australia. They did all the initial research. Um, this is an experiment being done where they're looking at croplands. So the first one that they did is wheat, a wheat field. And they were looking at unharvested harvested and then harvested and baled sites. So unharvested would be uh, the full fuel load of wheat. Harvested would be that it's been trimmed back and then harvested and baled as they trimmed it and removed the chaff and uh, baled it. So in the wheat, they've done 55 research burns. Uh, my, my presenter notes have a link. Uh, if you guys get a copy of it, there's an hour long presentation where the researcher sort of goes through the findings. I'll summarize them fairly quickly for you. Uh, they did light, again, some simultaneous fires. This image here, um, the guy in the upper right corner is Miguel Cruz. He's sort of the lead on this research over there. So he's showing these three different conditions of crops. The one on the far left is the control. So that's the block that's just been harvested. The one in the middle is unharvested wheat. So the full fuel load there. And then the far right is harvested and baled. So obviously there's a big difference between the rate of spread between all of them. The unharvested grass is, is moving the fastest. Have a look at that flame length on that middle image there. It's got the tallest flames, the, the largest intensities. And if you look, the control would be the next one down and then the harvested and baled uh, obviously goes the slowest and has the lower flame heights. So we all know this, I'm sure all of you have seen this, I have lots of experience out in the fields, but we have no way to forecast it. So I guess what I'm getting at is that the modelers are trying to study this and come up with a way where we can predict how fast the fires would move through different croplands. So um, under similar conditions, those unharvested grass fires spread two kilometers faster and had two meter taller flames than harvested. And then the harvested and baled spread two kilometers slower and had sort of a meter shorter flames than the harvested grass. And I guess this sort of debunks a myth. I hear sometimes some people think that that harvested condition of, of the wheat where it, you know, you have that sort of standing stubble. I've heard people say that they think fire would move faster through there. 
Um, and maybe that's based on their personal experience, but what the researchers are finding that those unharvested um, blocks move the fastest. So the research is ongoing. They're working on canola and barley next, and they hope to come out with some sort of tool to help us better understand how fire is going to spread in, in those um, crops. So let's get back to out of the jargon and back to entrapments. You know, I started my discussion, you know, talking about all these scary things, entrapments and fatalities and injuries related to firefighting. Um, it, you know, the reason I like fire behavior and I like talking about it is I want to pe keep people safe. And, and I'd like to share what I know in the hopes that it will help somebody else keep, be safe. Obviously, I don't do your job. And I'm just hoping that there's some sort of tidbit here that you might find useful and, and carry forward. Um, a couple of years ago, some colleagues and I started thinking about entrapments and, and what were we doing when they happened? You know, a lot of times the reports come back with temperatures and relative humidities and wind speeds and slopes, all the things we just talked about, but they don't talk about who was entrapped or, or what we were doing when we got entrapped. So what we did is we got one of our uh, training texts to help us look. We looked at entrapment documents from 2008 to 2018 from the Wildfire Lessons Learned Center in the USA. We came up with 98 total entrapment circumstances. So not all of them were fatalities, but they were all deemed entrapments by the Wildfire Lessons Learned Center. And we asked a few questions. So I have a poll here. Do you think... Which do you think more entrapments happen during direct attack or indirect attack? So here's my poll. Um, choose A or B, direct attack. Obviously, when you're going straight at the head of the fire, indirect attack, you know, maybe you're building a fire guard some distance away from the fire, or at any rate, there's probably unburned fuel between you and the fire. That's sort of a definition of indirect attack. All right, we're about 50-50 leaning towards more likely to be entrapped during indirect attack. All right, so we're sitting sort of 60-40. Most people feel that indirect attack is more likely what you were doing. Okay, hold that in your mind. What kind of resources are involved? This one, um, you can't text. You'd have to actually go to the website and click on the picture. Um, I'll leave you a few extra minutes. But like, which kind of resources are getting entrapped more often? So we've got a hotshot crew. We have an inmate crew, which we don't really have here, but uh, volunteer structural firefighters. We have hell attack, smoke jumpers, rappel, heavy equipment, engines. So we had those 90, what did I say, 90 five entrapment reports, who were they and, and what were they doing? So we see quite a lot of votes for wildland engine, a couple for structural volunteer folks, hotshot crew. We obviously know a couple of main stories of hotshot crews that have become entrapped and died. Not many votes for heavy equipment or hell attack. All right, cool. Thanks for responding. Uh, you know, we've got quite a few heavy equipment's catching up. You know, those folks are often undertrained when it comes to fire behavior, in my personal opinion. But uh, here's some, we've got wildfire engines, the heavy equipment and the hotshot crew. Okay, so let's go back to our little study. And this is what we found. Out of all those entrapment reports, it was actually almost half was during direct attack. So that's the opposite of what you guys thought. And also I've done this survey a couple times. I took it to an international conference and this is the general, general thought is that you're more likely to be entrapped during indirect attack. But what we found is that more than 50% of the time it was direct attack where you became entrapped. We found 17% was indirect attack. And then we sort of had to, to class out some scouting and disengage. So disengage would have been something like Yarnell where they had already made the decision to leave the fire ground, but were caught by the fire. Um, 
It's not a perfect science. We had to make some judgment calls based on what we saw in the report. But just as a rough idea, having a think, you know, nobody's asked these questions before. What are, what are we doing when we get entrapped? Here's the resources. You were right. Uh, the wildland engines were definitely by far the type of equipment that was most likely to be entrapped. And, you know, I made a joke about us burning engines during those experiments, but those volunteers were there to help us and they were convinced that they're, they were safe in their wildland units and they were going to attack all the fires that we lit um, successfully. And so our research budget had to go up dramatically where we had to replace a bunch of melted things on trucks. Um, after engines, it was heavy equipment. Uh, so this 37 entrapments had engines, that's more than half. Uh, heavy equipment was sort of there with a, another quarter of the entrapments and then it was sort of a mix of the rest. Uh, a lot of, it's interesting, single resources, you know, people who were scouting hose lays or whatever, they, they also tended to be entrapped. So, okay, all these things that you know, I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm just trying to provide the information that I have from a fire behavior perspective. And um, I like to break thing down, things down into charts and numbers. I hope that they haven't uh, exploded your brain on a Thursday afternoon. Um, I have another survey question here. We had some ideas of words that we were thinking in the beginning about grassland fires. Is there anything now that you might think differently when you're responding to a grass fire? This is my little survey question. Yeah, planning an escape. That's a good idea. Making sure that we're either anchored or, or have an escape route, especially when we can get conditions where intensities are greater that we can greater than we can directly attack. Caution is a good one. Laces, that's a good one. Nice to see a few people voting for laces and safety. Um, oftentimes we get caught up in the moment and I'm hoping that some of the information I gave you uh, might encourage you to take a breath and, and make sure that you've assessed the situation fully. Um, I like all these words. This is really great. Um, thinking about curing and wind and fuel loads, those are all words I used in my presentation. So I appreciate um, you being engaged and, and listening to what I had to say. Great, great to see safety come up as a big one there. I'm not trying to fear monger, I'm just trying to pass on what I know in the hopes that it will keep you or somebody in your command safe. So here's a summary of my key messages about it not just being a grass fire, insert eye roll there. Um, just a reminder that flame lengths bigger than five meters are possible. So I, I did uh, also consult with some of my friends in Australia um, and I asked him for some advice and he said to me, if the flames are taller than your truck, don't engage. That was sort of his rough rule of thumb. Uh, but here's flame lengths greater than five meters are definitely possible. So that's more than twice your height for sure. Uh, the intensities that you might encounter out there can definitely exceed your ability to direct attack them. Uh, I'm not as familiar with engine tactics. So, you know, maybe you can push those intensities a bit higher than 4,000 kilowatts per meter um, with some of the tools that you have on board. But I'm just telling you that there is definitely a point where even a bucket and a helicopter or a air tanker can affect that fire. So I'm assuming that your engine would also not be effective at that point. The rate of spreads that we can get in grass fire can easily outrun you. Um, there are, you know, those are fairly dramatic circumstances for them to be fast enough to outrun you. But if you add a little bit of topography in there or some dramatic winds, like 100 kilometer hour winds, which we know happen, they happen this spring down south, um, that can definitely force a fire to be moving much faster than, than you can move, especially if you have to go any sort of distance. Fine fuel moisture code or our ability to forecast sort of how dry the fuels are there is, is underestimating how dry it is. And that grassland fire environment changes so quickly. So I saw somebody in the comments talking about snow in the morning and grass fire in the afternoon. Um, definitely, definitely can happen in grass. Um, especially this time of year when the humidity is so low, those fine fuels with all their surface area, they react very quickly to changes in the weather. 
Uh, a reminder that as fuel load goes up, so the more grass in your field, uh, the more the intensity goes up. So it's going to be more difficult to control the more grass you have out there. Um, and the residence time related to that also goes up. So if you think you're going to drive your truck through the flame front or you're going to try to run through it, um, if you have anything, you know, more than three tons per hectare out there, uh, you're asking for some problems or dangerous things happening to people. The last one is that even though it looks green, uh, it still may be able to support fire spread. We saw those couple of conditions or examples of conditions where, you know, even at 50% cured, the grass would still spread and the grass could still have some fairly significant intensities as it's spreading. Um, so that's a friendly reminder of that. Um, so my end goal here was to just make sure that none of you end up in an entrapment situation or, or if you do that, maybe some of the knowledge from this presentation will some and, and help you make an educated decision um, about what to do next. I obviously want you all to be safe and confident out there. And uh, I think I'm going to wrap up what I have. I, I'm ending with this very embarrassing picture of me lighting grass on fire at those experiments. Somebody captured this and said that I did it in a very dainty way. They say that when you present, you should tell an embarrassing story. Well, here's my embarrassing story. It's a photo of me looking very dainty, lighting things on fire. Um, I'm going to pause now and ask uh, what questions do you have? Uh, we can go back through the chat and try to answer questions there. So, so Kelsey, there was there was one uh, that I got asked about where we get uh, updated red books, if you have any any answers to that. Yeah, it'd be the Canadian Forest Service website. They should be able to, there'll be a section called publications and you should be able to order them from there. And I think that's all I had in the chat. So I would imagine we can uh, open it up to anyone that might have questions for you via uh, clicking your mute button and, and just asking the question. Perfect. Hi, this is Eric. Can you hear me there? Yep. Uh, looking at the rates of spread and all that, there's different types of grass out there with different chemical contents. Was that looked into your, it was well into your studies? Because I know in my experience, I've done some travel around the world. I've seen green grass in, in Brazil burn just as fiercely as if it was cured here in Canada. Is that, uh, was that a consideration in the study? Uh, there was part of the master's study that was done by Susan Kidney. She did did some bomb calorimeter, the bomb calorimeter, where it looks at your uh, heat of combustion for the different grass types. And she looked at the ones in Canada um, and didn't find any significant differences. Uh, that was for native species, though. So uh, maybe you're right. Maybe there's some agronomic or cropland species that that might burn differently. Um, definitely something that we would have to look into. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, Kelsey, if I may, it's uh, Pank Kolowajczyk from Smoky Lake. And I Hi. just want to thank uh, the Alberta Fire Training Officers and the Hinton uh, Fire uh, Training Center for providing this uh, information. It's as timely and it's uh, updates on what we knew in the past or didn't know. And so I really appreciate uh, everybody that put this together. It's a great uh, reminder, refresher and training opportunity that we can take in via technology. So thank you everybody that's involved in this. Thank you for having me. Well, I guess, uh, thanks uh, everybody. I, if there's no more questions out there uh, for Kelsey, um, we will uh, we'll wrap up to today's events. And again, uh, um, oh, maybe been a couple here, hold on. <laughs> so there's, uh, 
uh, Southern Alberta, they have intense winds, usually with wildland fires. Rate of spread is really quite varied in different materials. Would wind calculation in the Australia was wind calculated in the Australia test? Uh, yep, they they had the wind speeds there. Um, obviously, they weren't lighting experimental fires in 100 kilometer per hour winds. I don't think anyone would get approval for that. So our understanding of fire spread once we get into those crazy southern Alberta winds, uh, definitely limited. So um, it would be great to get some observations from, from fires uh, burning under those conditions because we won't be able to light them experimentally, but any kind of observations from the field, I think that would be great. But nobody has time for that. <laughs> Uh, hey, Kelsey, it's uh, Michael Ty from Crows Nose Pass here. Uh, yep. With regards to the observations, where would you like those sent to? Uh, you can send them to me direct and I'll pass. Okay, because what I'm thinking so, of, we just had that, it's not in my jurisdiction, but the uh, Clarisome fire here about a month ago in a stubble, right? stubble field that uh, estimated uh, speeds were around to 12 to 15 kilometers an hour. But I know the fire chief there, maybe I can get that information to you. Yeah, for sure. If you can share my contact information, I would gladly take it forward. Um, I know people who would very much value that. So any kind of estimates, even if it's a video, a lot of times we can try to estimate rates of spread from fence posts, you know, distance between fence posts. Um, yeah, I would, I would appreciate that. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Kelsey. Awesome. Yeah. And, um, just to uh, update everybody, there was a couple of questions in the chat about the presentation. Um, Kelsey's uh, been kind enough to let us record this and we will get it up on the AFTOA website for use uh, at your disposal. So, um, Yeah, I, I do have links for all the videos in my um, presenter notes. I don't know if you want the raw PowerPoint, um, then you'd be able, I link to all the research as well. So I've got the the papers and the studies that I referenced included in my PowerPoint. So maybe I'll talk to you offline about if you want that, I'll pass forward as well. Sure, we can chat about that stuff definitely. And if there's certain links, then maybe we can just get it linked up uh, within the the context of the website, and then you can kind of keep yeah. your you can keep your uh, PowerPoint for for later potentially. So yeah, I can talk to you <laughs> after Kelsey. Sure. Yeah, let's talk about it. Cool. Well, um, thank you very much for sharing your afternoon and. Uh, letting me talk about something I'm passionate about. And please, anybody, my contact information is still up. If you have any questions, if you have observations, uh, please call me, I'm here for you. I know I work with Alberta Wildfire, but I like to reach out to everybody. Um, and I appreciate even just cool pictures of things you see in the field. So um, hook me up. Right on. Uh, and again, on behalf of the AFTOA, Kelsey, we wanna thank you and being able to work in conjunction with uh, Alberta Wildfire and the training center. Uh, and hopefully in the future, we can do a lot more of these as well um, and, and uh, working with other agencies and groups and uh, people. So uh, thanks again for the presentation. It was fantastic from, uh, from uh, an update perspective and, and a little bit of knowledge and stuff. So um, if there's no more questions, um, I will um, call this uh, training session over and we'll, uh, yeah, thanks again. Much, much appreciated. Thank you very much. And then Kelsey, I'll, um, I'll give you a call. And we can sure. chat with the other stuff so I can get up there. Sounds good. All right. Thanks again. Thank everybody. you, everybody. Thanks.